You're listening to a download from the outdoorstation.co.uk. Number 362. Hello and welcome back to the outdoorstation.co.uk. I know it's uh, been a while since our last audio podcast, way back in May 2013, uh, but many of you will possibly be aware that it's been a very big year for us at the Outdoor Station and backpackinglight.co.uk. In the previous podcast, you'll have heard Rose did the West Highland Way in April on her own, and we talked about that in detail. Then in May, I undertook the 34th RAB TGO Challenge with my walking buddies Tony and Lee. However, it wasn't a particularly good crossing for me for numerous reasons, and although I didn't do an audio series as I've done in the past, I did actually video it, and this is yet to be edited, in fact one on the case at the moment. The reason for the delay in the next podcast was simple. Since May, Rose and I have moved the entire backpacking light operation to new premises, which in turn had to be completely refurbished, and I've built a small virtual TV studio in the old premises. Oh yeah, and plus our daughter got married in the summer, and anyone who has been through that knows that it can be somewhat um, all-absorbing. Maybe you'll be slightly aware of this if you visited the Outdoors Station website, as there's now 40-odd videos to view. Now, all of this uh, media library, of course, is growing, and it all takes time. And although video interviews with people or about products is possibly the future, as these smart TVs and such devices start to take over the world, my first love is, of course, audio as I feel it's easier to dip into, lighter to carry, and paints brighter pictures of the mind for all of us. So why don't we get back into the swing of things with Jill and Peter Callahan, who in September 2013 undertook the 500-mile Camino de Santiago, the classic pilgrimage trail in Spain, recently brought to general prominence in the Hollywood film The Way. This is the first of a two-part interview, and naturally, I started off at the beginning, with the reasons they decided to undertake this particular journey. Well, for me, uh, it was to uh, uh, have a physical challenge and an emotional challenge of being away from home for that length of time, and to try and carry everything I needed on my back having not backpacked for probably 15 years. Yeah, for me it was um, drawing a line underneath uh, retirement last year. Uh, I just wanted to uh, have some time away from the normal day-to-day um, decision makings and things that are in your brain um, and then uh, move on into the, the next phase of the things that I'd like to do. All right, and so for people listening to this for the first time that have heard the name uh, the, of the Camino Santiago Give me a brief overview of what it actually consisted of from a, from a, from a distance point of view and the trip and, and you know the days that you, you, you're talking about. How many days were you doing this? Well, for us, we, we started the Camino in St. Jean de Piedeport in France and we were heading for Santiago, which um, is about 770 kilometres. We had a plan to walk it in 31 days, um, Although when we got to St John, we were actually given a, another plan to walk it in 34 days, and so we we sort of um, jiggled about with with both of those plans. Uh, yeah, the the idea was to walk about 15 miles a day, 25 kilometres a day. Um, we hadn't planned in any rest breaks because we thought being experienced walkers and having walked uh, things like the West Highland Way and walked the coast to coast, which was a, two-week walk well we thought it was just going to be an extended version of our coast-to-coast walk and that's what we had planned for and that was what we were emotionally ready for really all right okay well we'll we'll talk about emotions and things as as the interview unfolds because we obviously had a a brief chat a few minutes ago but um for for people considering it uh you know and, and they've literally probably just heard the name 
Um, what does the what does the walk consist of? What's the terrain like? What are we talking about as, as a thirty odd day walk? Are we? Is it mountainous? Is it flat? Is it is it uh, boring? You know how is it the the big pilgrimage walk that uh, that uh, people have heard about? Is it is it definitely a, an epiphany walk? It, it can be in different ways, not necessarily just religious. Um, most of the people that we met on the walk were doing it as a they were. Uh, seasoned walkers and they were doing it as as a physical challenge um, from Saint Jean you could have got two choices to uh, start your walk you can either go over the Pyrenees uh, the old Napoleon route as they call it uh, which means a um, 27 kilometer walk going uh, from 200 meters to uh, 1400 meters and then dropping back down to uh, 900 meters um, in one day, which is a, a big physical challenge on the first day, and you really need to have a view on whether you're going to do that on the first day or not. Um, that goes across the Pyrenees and takes you into Navarra, uh, which is beautiful. The, it was the delightful walk the first uh, three days because of the scenery that we saw. Uh, you go through Navarra, which is a wine growing region, and then into Rioja, which is an even bigger wine growing region. And that is absolutely beautiful. Um, you then go towards Palencia, which tends to be a little bit flatter, but still quite uh, a nice countryside, um, good scenery, plenty of shade when you're walking. Um, and I think that first half of the walk, or third of the walk, was exactly what we expected. It was um, nice scenery, nice countryside. The ground underneath was variable terrain it was um, rocky gritty uh, sometimes uh, concrete paths sometimes pavements obviously in town um, and in a lot of places some tarmac because the old uh, way or route goes um, beside the roads and because of the new roads what they've done is they've left the old road as the Camino as it oh, were nice. rather than just a, a country path it's it's not a cross country path um, at all really it's uh, on a, a mix of terrains you then get towards um, the middle third uh, which is what they call the Mesitas which is uh, open country about 800 metres up flat plains um, you can see the, the Asturias Mountains in the distance on the right hand side but the majority of it is very very um, unchanging um, it's through a wheat belt and that's the one of the uninteresting parts of the walk but if you like walking then it's a physical challenge to get through the 25k a day um, and particularly if uh, the weather is as good as it was when we were there with 30 degree heat uh, you've just got to make sure you've got plenty of water with that um, there are bits of it that go through industrial areas and we took a view on that um, and we decided to bus on uh, at some points during that because it wasn't the walking that we uh, had planned to do, walking through cities and industrial uh, estates uh, was not really something that we thought was of benefit to us. And then the last third was getting through into um, Galicia, which again is the beautiful part of the, of the world, in through chestnut forests uh, and uh, rivers and very rich countryside. That was very, very interesting, and that was really quite uplifting again as well in the last third. So for us, it was three sections, um, and during that time, uh, we made decisions. And obviously, um, we'll talk about those later on, some of the decisions we made just to, so to meet our plan, as it were. And the plan was 31 days and finish on September the 6th, uh, sorry, October the 6th, um, which we did. Well, that was that was a wonderful description, and, and I'm sure people can start to really visualise it now as we go into a bit more detail. Um, the the you, you, you're you're experienced walkers in the UK, as you've said, West Highland Way, and so on. This 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 walk did it did it come as a bit of a surprise once you started into it? Um, I th I think the organisation of the walk is is actually incredible, and we've not come across that anywhere before um, because. 
it's been walked for thousands of years and there are lots of places to stay along the way um, that are run on kind of a dormitory sort of basis um, lots of them that you can't book and um, so there was a, a bit of pressure to kind of get to a, find a bed for the night um, so, so that that element I think was a bit of a surprise um, but certainly at the beginning I think the scenery was one of the things that just made the walk wonderful because you kept going from over a, a hill into a d- different valley and the landscape was so different. Um, and, and then when the landscape became more samey in, in the middle third, that, that also was a bit of a shock as well, I think. Mm. Mm. I think for me the, the big difference was the numbers of people on the, the Camino. Mm. Um, to realise that there are 400 people uh, walking the same route as you on the same day as you are, all aiming for similar places. Um, obviously, there's no uh, service stations on a motorway. There are uh, lots of hostels that are spread out along the way, and you have choices as you go. But there are certain parts where there is only one town or village where the hostels are focused on. So you need to do your homework as to the uh, length of the walking that you're going to do that day to give you an opportunity to have a good chance of getting a rest at the end of the day. So that's part of the logistics. But it is a bit different when you suddenly look up and you see there's a 100 people in front of you Mm -hmm. stretching from where you are to the horizon and they're all doing the same walk as you. Mm -hmm. And that's something that we've never experienced before. The home of UK-based audio and video podcasts for lovers of the great outdoors everywhere. If you have any feedback, questions or suggestions, why not drop us a line directly to our email address, info at theoutdoorstation.co.uk. I presume the, the, the walk is open all year round. It's not a set season for, for walking this, is it? No, it, it is open all year round, though um, obviously in July and August it's even hotter than when we experienced it. Uh, and some of the the refugios, the albergues, do shut um, in November and December. Um, but yes, people do walk it all, all year round. Uh, and I mean, that's one of the unpredictable elements, isn't it? Whatever time of year you decide, the weather might not be kind to you or mm. might be kind to you. And that that's something that you have to um, contend with. I, I think the other surprising thing about it was that we walked through some parts of Spain that were actually quite poor and you could see that the the villages were totally dependent on the number of pilgrims who were walking it you know people running refugios running bars running little shops and there didn't seem to be anything else around as a means of earning an income other than that mm. Mm, I suppose that's uh, that's an, a, quite an eye opener as well. When you consider it, as you say, it's been going for thousands of years. Mm. You would have thought. Only you, what we were saying about the organisation. What were you meaning there, in the sense that because it's that old and that number of well, obviously, if you're experiencing three, four hundred people in your particular period of time, that's several thousand people a year, isn't it? That's that's doing it. Um, is it purely when you're referring to the organisation? Were you purely referring to the refugees and and the, the accommodation side, or is there another aspect that somebody thinking about it do they need to apply for it? Is it there's not that type of organisation, is there? No, uh, no, you don't need to apply for it. Although you do need to have a pilgrim's passport to be uh, able to stay in the refugios, uh, and so there is an organisation in terms of getting a passport which you can get. Um, through churches in your own country or through the confraternity of St James or you can visit somewhere along the way. We went into an office in St Jean de Piedeport and were given our passport and then you collect stamps along the way to prove that you've actually mm. um, made made the journey. Let's now actually start looking at the, the your particular walk, your own experience, your own personal experience. Um, this is, from what you were saying in your own admittance, uh, the longest walk that you'd attempted in your, in your walking career. Um, and everybody has different moments of highs and lows and, and that type of thing as they walk. But presumably, like all the rest of us, you know, when you first start off, you start off full of enthusiasm and lots of adrenaline's going and you want yeah. to get going and you see all these people. But, I mean, to start with, from what you were saying, actually when you sort of set out, there are people, for 100 people signing on a day. 
Uh, well, the day before we uh, uh, launched or took off, uh, there were 360 people registered. Um, we have seen figures, and, and Jill was talking about that uh, yesterday, in certain years where St. James's um, um, Saints Day falls on a Sunday, um, they have had a quarter of a million people do the Camino in one year. Um, but normally July and August, as we said, is the um, is the big the big two months, and they were surprised that September and were, there were so many people. But it may have been that they had the um, the way the mm. the film had had an effect because yeah, there was yeah. a lot more people who had seen the film the way uh, we hadn't actually. Um, uh, heard about it until two weeks before we left and we thought it was a documentary and we watched it and then we realized it was uh, not a documentary yeah, at yeah, all yeah. Um, but the um, for us uh, walking the way was as I say a, a physical challenge an emotional challenge and we just thought it was going to be an extended version of um, the coast to coast walk but mm. it turned out to be something uh, completely different really. well th- what I was going to lead on to say was because you know, you 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 you've you've set the um, the the challenge up in your your mind, and you're prepared yeah. for it, and you're ready to go, and you've got yourself sorted mentally and physically and gear and whatever else. But all of a sudden, you're on this. Well, motorway is a bit of a, an exaggeration, but you're on this sort of route, and then you see this. this it feels like this race building up that yeah. you perhaps didn't anticipate with all these people. Yes, I, I think that that was a pressure and that that thought that you may actually not find a bed at. at at the end of the day and in in actual fact on our third day of walking we had planned a 28 kilometer walk and uh, we arrived in this town and there was not a bed to be had anywhere and uh, we would we at that stage we were determined we were going to walk as much as possible so we actually walked another um, 10 kilometers on top of that uh, and ended up staying in a most delightful place we were uh, put up in a in a church um in the little loft area at the back of the church sleeping on a mattress with um four other people uh but it was that was a delightful experience but it did put us on edge i think about um Mm. the prospect that you could arrive somewhere and not have a bed yeah i think it was at that point that i realized that i was a little bit more competitive than i thought i was because uh, following that, I was actually counting people that I'd passed in during the day and during the morning just to make sure that if we passed more than 50 people, then we would had a little bit more chance of getting a bed at the end of the day. Mm. And then, of course, we didn't really want to walk in the, the extreme heat in the afternoon between 2 o'clock and 4 o'clock. So we'd set ourselves a target of half past one, quarter to two to finish our walks. Um, most of the time we did that, and uh, we didn't ever have to uh, worry about a bed after that at all we did worry about it but we didn't ever get pushed on again right um and looking back again i don't think i would worry much about it uh, if i were to do it again Mm. um i think i'd be a little bit more relaxed about it because everybody did find a solution at some point there was Mm. nobody sleeping out in the open or out in the forest as uh, a russian guy said he would do if he ever got caught out I think that's one of the biggest differences about walking the Camino and walking in England, because in England you kind of have your breakfast and start walking at half past nine and, you know, you can have a rest in the the middle of the day and probably finish four or five o'clock. Whereas here, people were getting up, I mean, some of them before six o'clock in the morning, but even we were starting out at half past seven, sometimes without any breakfast. And then very conscious of the fact that you couldn't really walk much after two o'clock in the afternoon. So, so. so are you getting up early because of the potential pressure of the accommodation or is it purely because walking in the cool um, was the more practical aspect? The, uh, for the cool, I think, as, mm. as much as anything. And we, d- we did kind of get later as things went on because uh, late, later on towards the end of the walk, it, it wasn't getting light until sort of quarter to eight. And where you have to kind of balance that, you don't want to be walking too much in the dark when the terrain underfoot is, uh, you know, you could trip, and we did meet people who had fallen and injured mm. themselves in, in the dark. But we're just conscious that you can't walk in that in that heat. Mm. You mentioned yeah. several times the the emotional preparation, the physical preparation for for doing it, and and um, let's just talk about say the first third of the the, the walk, the, the 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 more beautiful aspect, as you as you mentioned. 
Um, how, what changes did you find going through yourself and, and you know, in all aspects, physically and mentally and, and emotionally as you, as you took this on and, and got out the starting gates, as it were, with all these other people? How, how did things de- evolve for you? Well, I enjoyed it. Um, I had a big pack, quite a heavy pack, slightly heavier than I, I should have done, really. But it is one of those things where I thought, well, this won't do me any harm. Uh, I've done this before, and it's the same kind of size pack as I would normally use. Um, and so that first 17 days, to me, was fantastic. You know, I could feel myself getting um, stronger uh, and fitter. Um, and I was enjoying uh, the walk. I was enjoying the the sights, the sounds, and I was enjoying uh, talking to people. I'm a gregarious kind of character, and I got on very well with the people around us. Um, the only people that really started to irritate me at some point were the the cyclists who were on the Camino because you can do the Camino either on foot or on on a bike or on horseback. Of course, yeah, and yeah, uh, yeah. we actually saw five uh, people go through on horseback and we we met them sort of two or three days in a row um for strategic reasons or logistic reasons they weren't making that much progress at that stage um but later on obviously they made a lot of progress and then they were they were gone but uh yeah we were meeting these people and having great time great conversations with them even though we we're in competition for beds with them, but you know we were all laughing about that as well. But the first third for me was was good, and uh, I felt a lot stronger. Um, and it was everything you expected everything it to I be. Expected to be, yeah. yeah. So I suppose it, equivalent yeah. seventeen days was equivalent to you know doing a, a long walk in Scotland, wasn't it? Really? Great. Absolutely. So, so you I suppose you mentally you'd done that before, so you yeah, were you were happy right. to, uh, and we were ready for that, and yeah. the body was actually physically ready for it. But I did notice that um, I'd lost quite a bit of weight uh, around about at that point because I had to take my belt in about three notches mm. um, to get my trousers to stay up. What about yourself, Jill? Yeah, well, I'd agree that I mean that that first seventeen days were were the best and that that feeling strong and uh, I was very pleased that I'd been able to carry my kit although I did have to give um, Pete my sleeping bag because I had uh, gone overweight a little bit but it it is just that feeling you get a high from the walking and we did meet lots of interesting people towards the end of that 17 days I think the heat started to affect me more um, because it you know it was getting into 30 degree temperatures by half past 11 uh, and so I did find that a bit of a struggle. You're listening to The Outdoor Station. Award-winning producers of podcasts to inform, inspire, entertain and encourage people to enjoy a healthy outdoors lifestyle. It's all about getting out and having much more fun. Again, for people considering doing this, and obviously the, the temperatures there can be very, very warm, as you're ex- you've experienced even in September. Um, what's the, the the situation regarding hydration and getting water? And because obviously you need to carry an awful lot with you, otherwise. Well, we d- we didn't actually carry any more than a liter of water because there are lots of places where you can get water. Uh, I, mean, I mean, either bottled when you walk through small towns and villages, but there are a lot of fountains on the way as well. Um, so you can collect the water. Uh, and and the guides that we had did say if you were going through a stretch where there were n- no shops or, or no fountains. So a couple of times you had to carry two litres of water or a litre and a half. But Still, it's not a vast amount of weight, is it? No. So it's no. useful to know that, that that's there. And the guide, you're, I presume you're referring to the Cicerone guide? Yes, um, we, we took the Cicerone guide with us and that, that, that detailed all the small villages and towns and what sort of facilities that they had. Um, on board. So did you find that the the Cicerone guide, for example, gave you more confidence that, as you say, about food and water and all the full stops and commas, that perhaps the the, um, provided information uh, itself lacked? Well, uh, yes, it Yes, it did. And also the Cicerone guide wasn't divided into um, stages of the walk. So with the other, the other information we had was suggesting that you walk this far and, and 
in a day, whereas the Cicerone Guide just explained the route and all the places and facilities that there were. So you could then look at that and think, well, actually, I don't want to stop in one of the places that's been suggested. Where else could I find accommodation? And it was very good from that point of view. Right, right. Uh, And also some very detailed descriptions of some awkward places. I mean, by and large, the way was extremely well marked with yellow arrows and shells, but... um, there were a few times where you needed to sort of have a little bit of extra information, and that was there in the book. So it's a, it's a useful Bible for, for that particular walk, then, considering yeah. the other information that I can see on the table in front of me. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, it was good to have the, the, the complement, um, I think, of the, of the two mm. things. No, I think, oh, sorry, I, I think it only weighs about 100 grams <laughs> as well, which is even more important. It is available on, in digital format now if you need to, I'm sure. So you said, you know, obviously, you know, you're, you're getting into it, and you've done 17 days. Uh, 30, temp- 30 degree temperatures is pretty um, intense for for us British types who are not used to this temperature all the time. And uh, I should imagine that started to wear you down after a period of time, didn't it? Um, yeah. Well, for me, it was not so much as wear down as just suddenly hit a wall, and you know, my body gave up on me. So, um, and it was quite dramatic. In fact, I had just emailed everybody home to say how well we, <laughs> we, we were doing and that evening I just went down um, mm. yeah. Do you think it was heat exhaustion? I think? think it was uh, mm. uh, either uh, well a combination of heat exhaustion and um, maybe a, a bug or something mm. um, but what we decided then to do was to take two days out and, and so we took a taxi um, and moved to uh, Lyon and stayed two days in Lyon which was a really good idea and I think that was the the, the start of our proper decision making process um, that we uh, moved into about making value judgments about wh- whether we were going to do particular sections of the walk or not is it was it something that was part of what we wanted to do and that's it was at that point we started to readjust um, our plan, as it were. Let's just expand on that slightly, actually, because, uh, again, we've touched on it earlier on. Um, you uh, 17 days, it was the longest walk at that stage, I yep. think, presumably, you'd done. So now you're into what I would class as long-distance walking, proper long-distance walking. You go start to change your approach and your mindset yes. and a, a lot of attitudes mm-hmm. and things. You've, you've sort of got over the virgin state, as it were. Your, your body's warmed up. Uh, as well as the the um, the practicalities of the equipment that you're using, and you're suddenly realising what you do and you don't need, and so on. So, for for people who have never experienced that, can you try and sort of explain the cusp of that moment? What suddenly started to to change your approach? And I mean, obviously, the the um, the heat situation was was a trigger, but you know what happened next? Well. I, th- I think because because the route is such an old route, and obviously cities and large towns have grown up a- along it, partly in response to the number of pilgrims who used to go that way in the past, we began to think, well, actually, this is not a walk that's going through beautiful places necessarily. It's it's passing through those um, those towns, and do we really want to walk along? Um, a road and beside a main road or do we want to walk through an industrial area if it's going to go on for you know six miles is there a way to get round that and en- and enjoy the beautiful parts of the walk uh, and again the Cicerone guide explained where you were walking a- a- along those places and one thing about Spain is they have a very, very good bus service in certain places so we were able to pick and choose um, bits that we would would skip over, uh, and in all, I think we skipped about five days of of the walk in, in order to walk in the more beautiful places. Mm-hmm. In order, well, it was a holiday after all, yes. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and and also in order that we would physically finish. I think because I think once you have hit a wall uh, and gone down, your body's recovery rate is not quite the same as it had been before so if you've walked for four or five hours and you're exhausted um the siesta and and the night's sleep is not necessarily enough to to bump you back to 
mm. a proper level of fitness to start mm. the next day. I think we'd made the decision really that um, the first um, section where we'd been doing 38 kilometres, 28, 29 kilometres on a regular basis was not something that we could sustain after we'd hit the wall. So I mean, we'd lo- both lost quite a bit of weight at that time and I was starting to eat huge amounts to try and you know, mm. get the energy levels up. I think we made the decision that um, 25k was the, the maximum uh, length of time or distance that we were, we were going to walk because of the physical challenge that we, we mm-hmm. found it. And I think that was the right decision at that time. Um, and I'm really pleased with the fact that we ended up strong on the last three um, days that we were walking 20 kilometres um, and we felt good about the walk and we enjoyed the walk again, uh, mm-hmm. as we said, through mm-hmm. G- Galicia. So that decision-making there in Leon is to chop out those um, tedious uh, bits of the route, as they call them in the in the, all the guides, um, was uh, the right decision for us so that we actually fulfilled mm-hmm. our walking in beautiful countryside yeah. and finishing carrying our pack. In, uh, in retrospect, do you think that that um, the uh, length of the days you did when you first started, if you look, went to do it again, would you shorten those days to give you give you a bit more strength and, and under the same weather conditions you know the same to give you more strength yeah. to continue would that have, would you advise well, somebody not to try and put 30k days in? Possibly I mean I, I think we were very um, keen at that, that stage and it's, it's quite hard to get over that but I mean pe- people do their own own walking schedule don't they I mean we, we met people who had little experience of walking and they were aiming at 15 kilometers a day um, after the, the trip to Roncesvalles so you know you can do it in all sorts of in, in all sorts of ways um, I suppose we, we had perhaps put a bit more wear and tear on our bodies by doing those longer bits at the beginning, but mm. I think for us that was the right the right decision because, um, yeah. Mm, I, I think we wouldn't have been so bad if we hadn't been carrying so much weight, and I, I know that's something you want to talk about, mm. is the, the weight of the pack and the equipment that we had. I had a 15 kilo pack and that was twice as much as I should have carried really, and looking back on it, that's probably one of the biggest decisions that I would make is to be really strict ruthless. and ruthless with yeah. my pack yeah. because then uh, we wouldn't have gone down so quickly and our recovery rate would have been better and maybe that bit in the middle wouldn't quite have been so difficult mm. for us. Mm. seems like a natural place to pause the story and jill and peter will be back in part two to complete their journey for us next time i hope you've enjoyed hearing from us again and that you'll take time to visit the outdoorsstation.co.uk to catch up on our other activities the new studio the new videos and other stories so until next time folks take care out there bye for now for listening to this podcast to hear more from our extensive free library please visit the website at theoutdoorstation.co.uk the home of UK based audio and video podcasts for outdoors people everywhere